Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 47 of the weekly playback. I did get to play a number of some new to me games this last week, so I guess I will talk about those. But first, I apologize if I seem a little bit groggy. I've had a very long and tiring week, um, so I actually slept like 11 hours last night, but I still feel... I guess that's what's making me feel groggy maybe. <laughs> I don't know, but I just feel really tired still and just, yeah. So I cannot wait for the weekend. So, okay, Dobby. So let's just get into the games I played. So the first one I will talk about, I think Dobby wants me to talk about this one first, is Don't Go In There. <laughs> maybe because it has a cat in it, right, Dobby? Okay, so Don't Go In There is a 2022 game designed by Jeff Chin and Andrew Nerger. The art is done by Rupert Lewis Jones and it is published by Road to Infamy Games, R2I Games, uh, the same publisher as Canvas, of course. So um, I think I already said it's for two to four players. So it's like an open drafting, dice rolling, kind of like set collection kind of game, I guess. Not really set collection. A bit of set collection I guess I mean if you're because certain cards will allow you to do like different things if you get sets of them so anyway so this box turns into a dice tower so you open it up it's magnetic and then it will become a dice tower so I will uh, do a quick overview of this game right now so as I always do so I don't know why I just said that <laughs> but um, one thing I will mention is that when we were playing the game I kind of messed up the rules so but I'll explain why in a minute so depending on the number of players you're going to pick a different amount of sets of cards so there's different kinds of sets so I'll just hold them up for you guys so you can see all the different sets so you have dolls and they all will work differently of course um, there are amulets um, and this includes um, uh, the Kickstarter like sets, I think. Um, I think maybe the base game doesn't have a certain number of sets or something like that. Mask, Holy Water, Music Box, Portrait. I think she kind of looks like Wednesday from the Adams Family. Ring. Twin, which kind of looks like a young Tom Vassal, I guess. I don't know if that's supposed to be him. <laughs> but the hat, I feel like, makes it look like that. <laughs> um, candles. Raven. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Skull. And then mirror. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of these. <laughs> Clock, jack-o'-lantern, so as you can see it's a very Halloween, Halloween-y, Halloween-esque game. Cat, which of course we love the cats. Tome, and witch's brew. I just realized something. Um, Twin, I guess, also has this girl in it as well because she just was left over. So I'm just going to go back to the twins and see if it's just a mixture of all girls and the boy. If I can find it. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, actually, all the twins are different. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I don't think it's like that for the rest of the cards, but I wonder. That's weird. Like here's another one. Interesting. Okay, there are a couple of repeats. Hmm. Okay, so all the cards do different things. So depending on the number of players, you're going to pick a certain number of sets and then you'll have to remove certain cards. Um, you'll shuffle them and then remove a certain number. And you are going to have three different rooms set up. It doesn't matter which side you start with, just pick randomly. Um, there's two rooms on each board. So this one is the secret passage and the library. This one is the basement and the, the hallway. And then this one is the attic and the nursery. And above each room, you're going to uh, 
pick have three cards one of the rooms will require one of the cards to be face down and one of the rooms will require the cards to be in ascending order so on your turn you're basically going to take your meeple and just place it in one of the circles in the room and once there are three so you don't have to put it at the top you can put it anywhere you want and once there are three meeples in a room you will resolve that room that means you are going to roll the number of dice as indicated on all the cards that were above that room so like let's suppose there were two cats and one witch's brew above a certain room you would in that case roll five dice you would put them into the dice tower i guess if you want and the dice are I think I can't tell if they're glow in the dark. They look like they might be glow in the dark, but I can't really tell. So the dice um, are not regular dice. They're just dice with different like ghost faces on them on three sides. So then you'll roll the dice and then you'll see how many ghost icons each player will get. And then depending on where your meeple was in that room, that will determine how many ghosts you get. So like, let's suppose we got three ghosts. If your meeple was on this circle, you actually wouldn't get any ghosts because your flashlights scare the ghost away. However, if you were in the first spot, meaning you get the first choice of the card, however, you will have to take three ghosts because there are no flashlights associated with the first spot. So flashlights send ghosts away. In this game, the objective of the game is to end up with the fewest amount of curses at the end of the game. Curses, of course, are indicated by the numbers in the corners of each card. So again, you know, it's a kind of like a set collection game because different cards will allow you to do different things if you have sets of them. So like, for example, if you, um, not the cats, but like with the jack-o'-lanterns, if you're the first person, I believe, who gets a set of three jack-o'-lanterns, then you can dispel some curses, if I remember correctly, if I could find them. Um, yeah, so if you have three jack-o'-lanterns, Oh, I guess you don't have to be the first one. You can dispel two jack-o'-lanterns, meaning turn them upside down so that their curses don't count at the end of the game, or just one if a rival also has three. Um, there's one card, which I believe was the tome. If you get two of them, then you can dispel all cards of one type, which can be quite helpful. So, you know, you're trying to get different sets of different cards so that you can do different things. So after everyone resolves their ghost, then you take turns based on the order shown here, getting the three cards from the top. And then you flip this board over and pick three, draw three new cards from the deck of cards and put them on top. Once the deck of cards is empty and you can no longer refill a room, that room will just go away and the game will end once all the cards have been taken. Um, so basically that's how the game works. You Each player has a screen and behind your screen you will hide your ghost tokens um, and in front of your screen will be all the cards for players to see because you do need to be able to see other players' cards because some of the um, things on the cards depend on what other players have as well. And if you are the player with the most ghost tokens at the end of the game, every two ghost tokens you have will count as an extra curse and then whoever has the fewest amount of curses at the end of the game will win so it's not like a super complex game as you can tell it's like a pretty easy chill game um you know it's just a fun game with fun artwork i like it um you know i just i like halloween so it's a nice halloween themed game i can definitely see this being played around halloween time you know i played it with two other people last night um neither of whom were big fans of this game but again they also said that they would be happy to play it around halloween time but you know it wasn't like the most exciting game for them to play but i really really love the artwork so <laughs> yeah and again you know i didn't sleep the cards but it's okay i don't see this getting played like a whole lot it'll probably just be played around halloween time so that was the first game we played. Oh yeah, so the way that we messed up originally was when we first started putting down meeples, we put them in order. So like starting with the first spot, going down to the third spot, and then we're like, well, the fourth spot never gets taken. So then I reread the rules and realized you can just put them in any open spot in a room. And then after there are three, then the room gets resolved, which of course makes sense because, you know, if you go in the first spot, you won't get any flashlights to scare away any ghosts and ghosts can be bad. But if you, you know, go in one of the other spots, you can get flashlights. So that's good. Um, so yeah, so that was the first game. Well, not the first game, but the first one that I just talked about. So that is Don't Go In There. 
Um, bum, 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 bum. Alrighty, one second. The next game I will talk about is a new addition as well. So that is Iwari. So this just arrived last Friday, so I didn't get to show it to you guys last time. But Iwari is a 2020 game designed by M Michael Shacht, Shacht, I guess. Um, maybe, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. The artist is Matthew for this edition, Matthew Mizak, and the publisher of this edition is Thundergriff Games, and it's for two to six players. This is an area control game. I really wanted this game because there's this one designer friend I have, and I follow him on Twitter and Instagram, um, Jeff, and he, he actually wrote a book about game design as well. So he said that this was his favorite game ever. Of course, when he posted about it, it was the German edition called Koenig and something. I can't remember what it was called. Koenig and uh, I don't remember the other name of it now. But this is like a re-implementation of that game. Like that game has been turned into a couple of different editions, I think. Um, so this one is of course, of course, of course, a very deluxified edition of that um, area control game. So this edition, so I had this on my wish list ever since I saw Jeff mention that it was his favorite board game of all time. And of course, you know, back in 2020, I did not back this on Kickstarter and it was really hard to find a copy of this. So luckily I had posted in a Facebook group one day that I was in search of this. And then like two or three days later, someone actually posted that they were selling a copy. So that just worked out really well for me. So in this deluxe edition, it comes with several different maps, including some expansions, but I'll just show you what a map looks like. And honestly, one thing about this that I think maybe was not the best thing to do was like to make the player colors similar to the colors of the different regions, because Honestly, your player colors have nothing to do with the regions on the board. Um, and here are, I hope I don't spill everything out, but here are like the deluxified, I'll just pull some out. Here are like some deluxe um, totems. So here's like the purple ones. So they like stack up on top of each other and you, you can stack totems on top of other people's totems, of course, which you will be doing in this game. And let me just show you some cards and each person will have their own t like uh, tents. So each person is going to have tents and totems that they will be placing down based on their cards that they get. So there are a bunch of different cards with different locations on them. And again, your own player color has nothing to do with the locations that you'll be placing on. Um, so on your turn, what you can do, so there's the three, two, one rule in this game. So you can play up to three cards from your hand. I believe if I remember correctly, you will always have five cards in hand at a time, or maybe it was four. Let me just check the rule book real quickly. I can't remember if it was five or four. Do, 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 four. Okay, no, sorry, that's the display. Bum, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I don't remember how many cards, but anyway, you're going to have a certain number of cards in your hand and you will always get to replenish. So what you can do on your turn is, so the three, two, one rule, you can either play, so you can always play up to three cards um, just because you might want to just get rid of some cards so that you can draw some new ones. And you can always place up to two pieces, whether that's tents and or totems in one territory. So they always have to go in the same territory. So you can place one piece for each biome card or two biome cards of the same color can be used as a wild card. Um, so if an area is un unexplored, meaning that there's no tents or totems in there, then only a single tent can be placed. You cannot place up to two pieces then. But if an area has been previously explored, meaning there's already tents or totems there, then you can place up to two pieces. So if I wanted to, if I had two of the same card, I couldn't, and I didn't have a green card, but I really wanted to play in the green region, then I could use these two as a green card and place something in the green region. So this game has two phases and in the first phase only tents will be scored and then in the second phase you're going to also score for totems and you're going to score for tents again as well as settlement scoring. So this is one of those games and Jeff said it was one of his favorite games because every action you take can affect you but also other players and it can benefit other players. So 
As you know, if a region has not been explored, you can only place one thing in that region. However, if you do that, then you then open it up for the next couple of players, whatever, to place up to two things in that region. Settlements are, so the way tents will score, you're always, I mean, the scoring in this game is a little bit interesting. So let me just see if I can find that for you guys. Because obviously that's like the main part of this game, scoring. <laughs> so tent scoring. So the player with the most tents in a territory will receive one point for each tent in the territory, regardless of color. The player with the second most number of tents in a territory will receive one point for each tent belonging to the player with the most tents. Then the player with the third most number of tents in a territory territory will receive one point for each tent belonging to the player with the second most number of tents. You see how that works? It's kind of interesting. Um, and then totem scoring, when that happens at the end of the game, so totems, um, the players with the totems majorities in both connected territories. So between territories, you're going to see numbers. And that means that those two territories are connected. So like, for example, this one is going to be the 13th area, which is scored because it's number 13 and it connects the blue and the green region. So you're going to be scoring different connected areas. And the way that works is the players with a totem majority in both connected territories receive one point for each totem in both territories, regardless of color. So, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. so yeah, that's what you do. Um, ba -da -ba 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 -bum. So yeah, if, if there's a tie, then both players would receive it. And then I don't think you score for second most totem person. Um, so it's only the person with the most totems in a territory. And then again, you'll do tent scoring as you did in the first half, after the first half of the game. And then you go to settlement scoring. So a settlement is, this is where placing your tents in the first half of the game would have been really important because the settlement is formed by four or more tents of the same tribe that are uninterruptedly connected by one or more paths. Settlements may also cross territories and will score one point per tent. So this is the part where in the beginning of the first, in the first half of the game, most people were obviously trying to put down tents since those scored after the first half of the game and totems would not have scored. And you would try, be trying to create settlements. But again, if a region was unexplored, you could only put down one tent and then the next person could come along and put down two tents and mess up your plans to create a settlement and that is exactly what happened to me. However, I did well in the second part of the game with placing totems so that helped me I think and I ended up coming in second place and we played a five no one one two three yeah we played a five player game of this and I think I ended up coming in second place because of the totems. So yeah so that is the gist of the game it's just you know very basic rules but um the strategy and the scoring is where it all comes in and how you place things. Um, so you know the next time I play this I think I would be more careful about exploring territories that haven't been explored yet because I feel like I helped too many other players that way. <laughs> and also it's a look of the draw, like which cards you get in your hand, because you know again the different territories have different cards and you know you need certain cards to place into certain areas. But yeah, it's a really good area control game. So if you like area control games, area majority games, I think you would enjoy this one, especially if you enjoy deluxified games, which this very much is a deluxified game. Um, so yeah, so again, this one comes with a lot of maps because um, it is a deluxe version. So in each board has two different maps like on both sides. So like just to, I can just show you an example because this one. So this one would play with an expansion because it also has purple on it, I believe. So the purple was part of an expansion. So yeah. I don't remember what the original name of the game is, Koenig and something. So if you're interested, you might still be able to find it with its original name. Actually, maybe if I just click on the designer's name, I could find it. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. It's known as Web of Power. So I guess that's one name for it, Web of Power. And that came out in 20, 2000. It came out in 2000. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can't see the German name for it, but it's known as Web of Power if you're interested in getting it. Yeah. So that was Iwari. Mm -hmm. So that was a new arrival for me in another new game that I played. 
Let's see what else I can talk about. Um, another game I played over the weekend was Battlestar Galactica, the board game, and that was my first time ever playing that board game. Um, so Battlestar Galactica, the board game, came out in 2008. It's for three to six players, designed by Corey Konichka and a couple of artists, and it's published by Fantasy Flight Games. Um, so this three to six player game is like a bluffing deduction game, like hit and roll game, which I had no idea. Like whenever I heard people talk about Battlestar Galactica, like I'd heard so much about this board game, so I'd really been dying to play it. I thought it was going to be like a strategy, like just like a strategy kind of game of some kind without any like hidden rolls or bluffing of any kind. So that I was in for a surprise. I did not know it was like that. Um, you know, I thought it was okay. So I guess this is maybe the first ever. I think I was told at least that it was the first game of its kind with hidden rolls and bluffing and deduction. And I could kind of see like, you know, all the other games I've played before this one that have those mechanics in them, I could see similarities or how they might have borrowed from this game, you know? Um, so in this game, you know, you have different identities and you are either a cyborg, I think that was the word, or you're not a cyborg, or cyclone, sorry, Cylon, not cyborg. <laughs> Cylon, not cyclone either, <laughs> cyclone, Cylon. So you're either a Cylon or not. And um, as you can tell, I've not seen the TV show, but maybe I should, I've heard it's really good. <laughs> so yeah, so, um, so yeah, so you, are handed out an identity card but you can I guess kind of choose what you kind of want to be in the beginning so I said I wanted to be in politics or whatever so I actually ended up being the president in the beginning but I was not a Cylon I was not a Cylon in both parts of the game because then the second half of the game you're given another card which kind of confuses me I'm like because then what if you have two conflicting cards like what if you have one card that says you're a Cylon and one card that says you're not a Cylon. I'm, I'm a bit unsure as, as to how that works out. If you've played this game, you can let me know. I was kind of not really understanding it that well because of the fact that people could have two cards. I just, I don't know. But, and then in some, like in the game we played, one of the people ended up like revealing that he was actually a Cylon. And, but yeah, I mean, it seemed fun for as much as I could understand it. <laughs> so um, I, I would be willing to play it again. I wouldn't say right now that it's my favorite hidden role, like bluffing, deduction game but um I'd be willing to play it again but maybe I would enjoy it more if I actually saw the tv show so maybe I should add, add this to my watch list so yeah so that was another game I played another game I played which I'd never played before is called Okie Doki. so Okie Doki, also known as level 10 is a game that came out in 2016 it's for one to five players designed by uh Hisashi Hayashi um art done by Ryo Niyamo and it's published by uh, Gikach Games and Madagot and uh, a few others including Tasty Minstrel Games which of course went out of business. So this is like a cooperative game in which you can't really you can talk but there are certain things you can't say so you're supposed to stay positive while you're speaking speaking like you can't say any negatives so each player is going to have a hand of cards and you know there's going to be cer a certain number of rows and in each round you can only put cards into the one column and you're trying to get the columns to um, you're only you can only increase the number unless of course you reset a row and then you can after you reset a row then you can start back with a different number and but again have to go in ascending order you're just basically trying to get all your cards played of all the different colors in ascending order in their color row um that's basically it uh, you know I don't think it's the most amazing game ever like it's fine like you can you know talk during the game and you can be like you know, so like if I had a card that would come sequentially right after another card in like say the blue row, I could say something like, I have the best card for the blue in this round, which would indicate to the other players, like let's suppose the previous blue number was three, that would mean I'd have a four. So I would say I have the best blue card to put down to indicate it's the very next number in that row. So we don't want to reset this, like if we can avoid it, because I have a really good card for that row. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just like a cooperative game where you're just trying to put down cards and certain, you 
know, in a certain order and in their color rows. Like it was okay. I didn't think it was like super duper amazing. Um, but yeah, it's cute. It's got, you know, cute little animals on it. And it's like, you know, it's supposed to look like a, a sheet of music in the end. Like I'll have thrown up a picture hopefully so you can see that. So I played a three player game of that, which was fine. Um, and then I also played a game of Architects of the West Kingdom. I didn't pull it out because we actually didn't finish the game. So um, I played it once before. I played this game once before a long time ago, like this is back in 2020. And that was over video chat. And I actually played it with Jan from Quackalope at the time over video chat. And I did finish it the game at that time. And I remember at that time when I played it, I actually understood it better. Um, since we didn't actually finish the game this time and I was just really tired. I've just been super duper exhausted. I've just had a lot going on. So I wasn't like fully in involved in this game when I was playing it this time. So I figured I just wouldn't do it justice even if I pulled it off of the shelf today. So I figured the next time I play it, I can talk about it properly. But you know, of course it's a Shem Phillips game, Shem Phillips game and it's worker placement and you're, you know, so next time I play it, I'll talk about it properly. But it's a good game from what I can remember from when I played it back in 2020. So those are the only games I played. Um, moving on to games that I am backing, still the Fog Escape from Paradise, and um, the deadline for that is September 22nd. I am not uh, culling anything at the moment, but I will be in the future, hopefully. Um, games that I received, I actually did receive a game, but it's not within reach and I forgot to bring it here, but it's a game that I'll be covering for Kickstarter. So I'll talk about it in the next video, hopefully. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so moving on. Sorry, this is a really short video, but maybe just as well since I'm just really, really out of it. Super tired, super groggy. Okay, so questions and commentary. So thank you for telling me about which superpowers you guys would want. That was fun to read about. Um, someone asked me a question. They said, what is your least favorite style of game or mechanism in a game? Or better yet, what is the game, what is a game that you absolutely hate? So I'll try answering both parts of the question. So I don't think I have a least favorite style of game. Well, actually, I guess I do. I guess my least favorite style of game would be dungeon crawler. I've, you know, tried playing dungeon crawlers. I just can't really get into them or narrative driven games. I like games that are like one shot games. Like you just sit down, play the game and you're done and you don't have to come back to it and pick up where you left off and like, you know, reset the board or whatever. And it's not going to take you like eight years to finish a game or something like that. Like I like one shot board games. So yeah, dungeon crawlers not interested in or campaign style games I am not interested in. Um, in fact, I just um, emailed because I one of the Kickstarters I have outstanding, my oldest Kickstarter that I have outstanding is Adventures in Neverland. And I don't even know if this game will ever deliver. And, you know, I was just thinking about it like chances are I'm not going to enjoy this game. And the fact that I'm a Peter Pan fan is not enough to have justified backing it. And since they're just super delayed in delivering it, I just see, I just email them to see if I could get a refund. If they say yes, great. If not, then I'll just probably sell it on once it arrives, just because it was probably a mistake in backing that game since I'm not really into campaign or narrative driven games or dungeon crawlers. And the only reason I backed Adventures in Neverland was because of Peter Pan, because I like Peter Pan. Well, I like, you know, the whole story, but I especially liked the movie Hook with um, Robin Williams in it. That was like one of my favorite movies when I was really, really little. So yeah. Um, so yeah. So the next question is, or better yet, what is a game you absolutely hate? So I can answer that question. Okay. So another kind of game I don't like is games that just never seem to end. Like I do not want to sit at a game table for like four hours. So that's why I did not like Ark Nova. And that is why I absolutely hate Munchkin. Like I remember the first and only time I ever played Munchkin, we were playing, I think it was a five player game of it. And I was just so freaking miserable because this game just would not end. And it was a game I was not enjoying. I felt like there was really no strategy. It was just kind of like a silly party game and it just kept on changing and just kept on getting longer and longer and just didn't have an end in sight. And I was just so miserable and just wanted it to end 
ASAP. I'm kind of sad I don't like Munchkin because they do a lot of really cool IPs. Um, so, you know, Munchkin has so many different versions with different intellectual properties that, you know, I would love. Like maybe they have a Flintstones version. I don't know. But, you know, I've always wanted a really good Flintstones game. So they do have a lot of cool IPs. But yeah, I absolutely hate Munchkin and will never ever play it again. So, you know, the same question for you guys. I would really love to know what is your least favorite style of game or mechanism in a game and what is a game that you absolutely hate yeah so don't hold back just tell me what game you absolutely hate even if it's one that i really love because i would love to know so those are the games that i absolutely do not like yeah so i guess that's it um so yeah i know it's been forever since i've done a one minute overview video like just looking at my youtube page like the last one i think i did was maybe in july or august so it's been a super duper long time so i just thought i would talk about the games that i'll be covering in the coming weeks because i do have a number of one minute videos to make which i haven't done yet so i'll be making a video of this uh, game called headspin then bestiary sigillum dreadful meadows which is a shem well so Shem Phillips recently joined on with um, this new this publisher called Arcus Games and they published Shelfie Stacker. So I'm going to be covering their new game called Dreadful Meadows, which I'm super excited about because once it arrives, I'll show it to you. But it's like Halloween themed. So as soon as I saw it, I like had to reach out to them ASAP because I was like Halloween themed like worker placement game yes please so I'm super excited that I get to cover that game so I'll be covering that for its Kickstarter launch which will be next month um, Heist in Hyperspace which is the game I meant to show you today but I put it somewhere and I can't find it right now and Skull um, so Skull I'll be covering soon that you'll see my video for that really soon and then of course Life in the Amazonia and then a game called Passengers which I was supposed to cover many 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 months ago I received the original prototype for it like I don't know like 10 months ago something like that but um, they now since have a new prototype for it and so they're going to be shipping the new prototype to me for me to play and make a video of because that kickstarter got delayed by a lot so yeah so you will be seeing some one minute videos coming from me in the next few weeks so a total of one two three four five six seven so i have seven videos on the docket that i need to do in the next coming weeks which um i hope i will be able to do in a timely fashion um you know did I say Tomly? I meant timely, timely fashion. <laughs> Cause you know, that's just my, the, my whole apartment situation is just really stressing me out and packing and everything. I just, I know I, I know I sound like a broken record saying the same thing every time, but just, I just really cannot wait to move and have my own like actual recording space because having to clear off this table and stuff is just such a pain. So yeah, so you know, the countdown to moving has begun as well. So my official move in date, I can officially move in on November 13th. So I'm super duper excited. So yeah, so we shall see. Um, so I guess that's it. So I hope you guys will answer the questions that were posed to you in this video. And I guess I will see you next week and hopefully not be as groggy and such a mess. All right, thanks, bye. Thank you.